everyone, I'm Stephanie. And I'm Sandy. And this is the Italian American Stories Podcast. Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. I'm really excited for Christmas this year. I just wish it was, we're not going to get any snow. That's kind of a bummer. I know. <laughs> yeah. We got snow a couple weeks ago, but it's all melted. Yeah. <laughs> so. But that's okay. Yeah. I'm was, excited too. Me too. It'll be fun. Uh, so we're going to do a Christmas episode, kind of like what we did at Halloween. Um, and so we're not going to focus on like one Italian American or an Italian American family. Um, we're just going to talk about a few stories slash people that revolve around Christmas. Um, some are sad, some are funny, some are strange. <laughs> so it'll be fun. It'll be fun. Um, so like before, just kind of dug through newspaper databases and found some interesting, interesting articles that we're going to read today. So I want to start with an article dated December 24th, 1913, and it's from the Patriot newspaper out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And the headline reads, Christmas present ends divorce suit. Family reunited to eat turkey and spaghetti together tomorrow. (laughs) That's funny. (laughs) It's a weird combination, Uh turkey and spaghetti. (laughs) Um, So apparently what happened was John and Rosa Belfi, they were in the process of getting a divorce. And the couple had seven children together. So that's... That's a big family. Yeah, it is. And thinking of 1913. Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, And so John, he was in business with his brother. And him and his brother, they ran a sculpting and mosaic business. And Rosa and John, they were married on September 7th, 1897. So by this time, they had been married 16 years. Wow. Yeah, that's a long time. Um, However, they did separate in 1911. Because Rosa became suspicious that he was having an affair with a woman who lived in Italy, in Italy. I'm not really sure how she figured this out. It was like, you know, he was texting or emailing her in 1913. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Maybe she saw some letters or something. But he, John declared, like, the relationship is completely platonic. We're just friends. So I don't know how he was communicating with this woman. Yeah, because... You're just not traveling to Italy and back. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's like, it had to have been through letters. Mm-hmm. Which I would be... Like, You're right. That's yeah. suspicious. It's weird. Yeah. Why are you writing some woman? Um, and it was that answer was not satisfactory to Rosa either because she filed for divorce. Um, so John, he obviously opposed the divorce, saying that his wife's accusation was more, quote, imaginary than real. <laughs> So, and he did. He worked hard to convince her that he still loved her and he wanted to keep the family together. And with Christmas being so close, he would constantly remind her of all the great Christmases they've had together, but she was still not ready to forgive him. And then John, he decided that he would give his wife a gift that he felt would prove his love for her. And what he did was he put their, the house that he that they lived in. So he owned the house, but he put it in her name. <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah. I and, wonder what happened to that woman in Italy. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, what happened? I don't know. I, did you, Because it's like, you can give me the house, but are you still going to keep talking to this woman? <laughs> um, and so this worked because on December 23rd, she dropped the divorce suit and uh, welcomed him back home. To her wow. house. <laughs> Not his house, her house. And the reporter of the article, they wrote, um, the Christmas spirit has entered the divorce court. An estranged family reunited will eat turkey and because of their nationality, spaghetti. <laughs> it's like, are you just assuming that? Right. Like, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> because... Maybe they just love spaghetti. <laughs> Maybe they just love spaghetti. Or are you just looking at them and saying... Yeah, it's Christmas. They're probably going to eat turkey, and they're Italian, so probably some kind of macaroni. (laughs) That's funny. I know. It made me laugh. Um, I did look up this family on Ancestry.com, and it looks like they did stay together and never divorced, so... Oh, that's good. Yeah, so their marriage, you know, it survived. Um, Sadly, though, Rosa did pass away in 1918 at the age of 44, which is pretty young. Yeah. Um, I couldn't figure out why. Um, but John lived until 1944 and he was 73 years old. So I wonder if he was still single. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, 1919, somebody from Italy moved, <laughs> moved on over. <laughs> no, 
that's terrible. <laughs> that was funny, though. It was funny. <laughs> um, so now we're going to jump back to 1894 and head to New York City. And this article was from the New York Tribune, and it was dis- dated December 25th, 1894. And it had a headline that read, Little Ones Had a Feast, Two Big Dinners for Italian Children in the Bend. I didn't know what the bend was, um, so I researched it. And it sounds like, so you have Mulberry Street, which is generally known as the Little Italy area. I don't know as much if it is now, but back then it was for sure. I think it still is. Um, And so you have Mulberry Street, and the road curves. And so they called that the bend. they just call it the bend. Yeah. Um, But let me know if I'm wrong, New York listeners. This is... I'm a Colorado girl. <laughs> I just Googled that and looked off of Wikipedia, which is not always a <laughs> great resource. But so anyways, um, so a Miss Anson Phelps, uh, she was kind of like a philanthropist um, in the New York City area at that time. Um, their family was known to donate and contribute a, lot, contribute a lot to the poor and all of that kind of stuff in the New York City area. She was actually the one that put on this huge Christmas dinner for the children in the Little Italy area. So the dinner was held on Christmas Eve, um, and it was held at a place called the Italian Reading Room. And I'm not 100% sure what this is, but from the research I did, I I think it is a room in a church or in a library for Italians. (laughs) Somewhere where they all meet. Yeah, maybe that is what it is, like a meeting Mm -hmm. room. Um, So, yeah, but anyways, that's where they had the the dinner. And um, they actually did two dinners. They had one in the afternoon for the younger kids and one in the evening for the older kids. And the admission to get into these dinners were that you had to have clean hands and faces. <laughs> so, um, what are they trying to say? I know, right? <laughs> and so the group was, they were really proud to be holding these dinners for the Italian children because this doesn't sound great, but I'm going to say it anyways. Honestly, they kind of look down upon the Italian children. Right. It, just like you were just saying a second ago, like, you have to have clean hands and faces. Like, what are you insinuating? Right. You know? And I'm not trying to trash their charitable efforts because, like, that's great that they're wanting to, you know, help out families who maybe just came to America and are struggling. Um, but the way they discuss the Italian children and their families <laughs> in this article, and, and maybe it's just a diff- time difference, like 1894 to 2023, very different context. But Do they really see the kids that way, or it, are they just assuming that's... Exactly, yeah. Like, they're not kept properly. They're not kept up, because they call them waifs at one point, <laughs> and... And they're very like, and we did this and all of this stuff for these poor little waif children. And you're just like, Ugh. Oh, yeah, maybe making an extra pat on the back for themselves. Exactly, and yeah. They, and then, They were really needy. Like, we really did a service this year for Christmas. And again, I'm not trying to, you know, I try not to get too judgy for stuff that people right. did or said in the past. But, <laughs> man, there's times where you read these articles and you're like just made the hair stand up in the back of my neck a little bit. <laughs> Good Lord. And so here's an example. At one point they state, Italian children to whom meat is a rarity and whose homes are in the gloomy, dirty tenement houses, which form the chief part of the architecture of Mulberry Street. <laughs> you know, instead of just saying mm. the guests were Italian children from the little Italy area, they have to describe their their home circumstances, their life, in Mm -hmm. such a bleak manner. It's just, I don't know. (laughs) Now, they did eventually compliment the children by saying they were clean, bright-eyed, and respectful. So, you know, that's good. There you go. (laughs) There we go. (laughs) Um, And so what they did was they put out really long tables for the kids to eat at. And the tables, they were decorated with Christmas trees and shiny tinsel and they had several teachers from the local church there to serve the, this is a quote, swarthy, hued, black-eyed children. Oh, boy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's just it's those kind of things where it's like, you can't just say children. Right. <laughs> you got to add all that in. Um, and so when the priest, they also said that when the priest <laughs> said grace... They described this scene by saying 147 pairs of little brown hands were clasped together and 147 little black heads were bowed. <laughs> Look, I'm all for getting descriptive with your writing, but <laughs> right. this is too far. 
Um, and so this dinner for the Italian children, it consisted of turkey, vegetables, bread and butter, ice cream, and cake. And at the end of the article, <laughs> they, they literally told how much food they fed. So they said they went through 250 pounds of turkey, 100 loaves of bread, which to me doesn't seem like enough bread. <laughs> like a hundred loaves, but I mean, I don't know. I don't know how many kids they fed. A hundred cakes, eighty quarts of ice cream, and they said that they said the little waifs ate quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, when the kids left the dinner, they were given one big orange and half a pound of candy. I know, right? <laughs> How do they figure that out? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny. And so, like I said, it's very generous that they had this dinner and fed the kids. Um, it's just it's right. just crazy how they describe it. <laughs> have to throw all that in. All that in, yep. Okay, so we've had our happy story where a family reunites, a story about Ital- Italian children getting fed and insulted <laughs> at Christmas. <laughs> and now we have a sad story. And this one, I will say, I almost didn't put this story in because... I know if I'm going to have trouble getting through this, mom's going to have trouble getting through this <laughs> story. Um, and there's even things like, there was a couple quotes that I left out because I was like, well, I, mom is definitely going to cry and I might cry. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, so we're going to stay in New York City and we're going to go back even further now to 1884. This headline is from the New York Herald. And it reads, I want to live till Christmas. The little Italian girl who could not wait for Santa Claus. Oh. Uh, No. Um, And so uh, this little girl, her name was Maria Donnelly. And she she became ill somewhere somewhere in the summer, fall of 1884. And she had tuberculosis. And so she was, she'd been in the hospital for months. And her mother, father, and brother, they would visit her every day in the hospital. But... Unfortunately, she was expected to pass right around Christmas time. Oh. I know. Um, but she kept saying that she just had one wish, and that was to see Santa. So That's sad. Uh... I know. This poor family. Um, so one of the nurses, her name was Miss Hazelton. Um, she would have the children come sing carols to Maria, and a lot of people would bring her Christmas gifts and ha- have her open them that day because they weren't sure when she was right. going to pass. That's that's good. It is, yeah. Um, so she would get dolls and candy. And then it just said a miscarry. So I don't know if she was just volunteering at the hospital. She would come feed her jelly. That's funny. I know. Could she not eat? That's what true? I was wondering. So could to give her something sweet? Exactly. Like, was she so sick like she would... You know, yeah, couldn't hold it. Couldn't hold it down, and so maybe jelly was. I don't know. I was yeah, I, that's jelly seemed different. funny to me too, and I was wondering. I'm like, did jelly have a <laughs> different meaning in 1884? Maybe there was Jello. No, <laughs> Jello. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what it. Jelly was that was Jello for back then. Who knows? <laughs> that makes sense though. I mean, because there was you know, even Jello back. Sick then. people eat Jello. Right. Older people in nursing homes. Yeah. Um, And, you know, I think it's, you're probably right, though, about her not being able to hold stuff down because um, her brother, he would come spend the evenings with her. So her mother and father would spend the day with her. And then her brother, Antonio, he was older. He would come spend the evenings with her. And she told him one night that um, she wanted to eat boiled chestnuts. And so he snuck some in for for her. And one of the nurses was kind of irritated about it, but decided to let it go because Maria didn't have long to live. Right. What? Like, what's difference. the difference? Mm-hmm. But I wonder if it was because she couldn't hold more solid stuff down. Yeah, it sounds like it, because why would he have to sneak them in? Exactly, yeah, mm-hmm. and he did sneak them in, and, and then the nurse was irritated about it, but she was quoted saying, like, she just let it go, because <laughs> it's like, what do you do? they probably had to clean up. They probably had to clean up, yeah, <laughs> that might have been why she was irritated. So I couldn't find much on this family. I mean, this article is from 1884, so... Um, but I hope that she saw Santa, so... Right, well, at least they did their best. Exactly. And the hospital seemed very, um, like, like you said, their best. Like, singing carols and bringing right. gifts and, yeah. You so. would think that somebody would have dressed up as Santa and I, came and visited I was it. thinking that, Or too. did they do that back then? Or... I, yeah, I don't know. But she wanted to see Santa, right. so she had a visual image of 
she knew what Santa looks like, looked like. So, yeah. yeah, hopefully somebody did. Um, like I said, sad, I left but... out a couple of the mom's quotes because I was like, oh, I don't think I can get through reading those. So I, I did pretty good. You did. You did pretty good. <laughs> she, she just got a little red around the eyes, but I didn't really see any tears. So. <laughs> um, so, okay, so we're going to kind of switch gears now and go into almost kind of like a theme for a while. And this is going to take us away from America in a sense. Um, so when I was researching, you know, the databases for this episode, I kept running across articles with headlines like Christmas celebrations in lands near and far, Christmas in many lands. And so these were all American newspapers describing what Christmas is like in other countries. So I thought it would be interesting to dive into what they had to say about Italy. Yeah. So the first one I want to go over is from the Times Picune in New Orleans, and it's dated December 25th, 1903. And in this article, the reporter, they just interviewed people who lived in New Orleans um, who visited or came from different countries. And so the person they interviewed for the Italy part, they didn't give a name, but uh, this person said that Christmas is a big celebration in Italy. However, they said that the celebration used to be a lot bigger, especially in Rome. So I guess the people of Rome would have large parades and their celebrations were quite noisy. But um, I guess the government kind of put a stop to that. And so now the celebrations are pretty quiet, except for the religious ones. So. Huh, I wonder why. I don't know. Um, why do they not want... Yeah. I'm sure it wasn't like a riot or anything. Exactly. <laughs> it's just people probably out drinking wine, maybe watching a parade or something. I, I don't know. I thought that was interesting. And this is one person's perspective, so... Who knows? Um, so, but he talked about the, he, she, I don't know, talked about the religious ceremonies that would take place on Christmas Eve. The Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, they were so crowded that people would stand in the streets around the church to feel like they were attending. Wow. Um, that's, yeah. that's nice. That'd be a cool thing to be at. Because mm-hmm. uh, it was at St. Patrick's and Rome and stuff. So, and so they said that it is customary to exchange gifts in Rome, but Typically, there is not a tree to gather around. Uh, Article that I read where they said that there was a basket that they would have the presents in. And then I saw another thing that said, um, like, just around the hearth, the fireplace. So I think it's, you know, maybe different regions. Everybody, each family, you know, has their own traditions and stuff. Yeah, because you would think if a tree was the way it is now. Yeah. That somebody would have a tree. Have a tree. But, you know, it is Italy, not America, too, though, so... Their yeah, traditions could be different, yeah. you know, are different than ours. Um, and so, but, you know, like you and I were just talking about, it's hard for me to imagine Christmas right. without a tree. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this person said that the Christmas spirit was still very alive, even without the tree. Um, they do hang stockings, though. So, but so the person being interviewed said, quote, Throughout all of Italy, and especially in the country, Christmas Eve is celebrated with a supper in every family. They then have their Christmas feast, and the supper becomes a family affair, where those who have been separated come together again. I just kind of like it. The yeah, way that that's person, nice. Yeah, worded that. That was kind of cool. So, And like I said, this was one person's perspective on what Christmas was like in Rome. So, right. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> this made me laugh because kind of towards the end of the article, the person said that Christmas Day is known as a universal day of peace and the year of hatred is forgotten on that day. (laughs) (laughs) Till Levino comes out. Till Levino comes out and then it's all back. (laughs) New Year's Eve, it's all over. (laughs) So, um, and so the next article, it comes from the Trenton Evening Times from Trenton, New Jersey. And the article is dated December 19th, 1918. And the headline reads, let's have dinner with our allies over the sea. Put this in context, World War I ended the the month prior to this article being published. So World War I ended ended in November of 1918. So the article basically broke down what each of America's allies would cook during Christmas. (laughs) So um, I know it's kind of interesting and it provided recipes. Oh, too. Nice. So, yeah. Um, so, for example, Japan had a rice recipe. France had a salad recipe. Belgium had sweet potatoes. Britain had mince pies. And Italy had two. It had an Italian fish recipe and a stuffing recipe. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to read the recipes, but I could post them on Instagram, I guess. So, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. The reporter started the article, like, when they got to the Italy section, talking about Italy and Italy's Christmas food, and they said, quote, From Italy, the land that knows so well how to get along without meat, 
how to extend the meat flavor to vegetables and pastes. <laughs> so, um, and then they kind of go on talking about like, we should do well to choose some part of our Christmas dinner. And I, I don't know, I didn't really get it. I think what they were saying was choose this kind of cooking to do well for your own Christmas dinner. I don't know, it got really confusing and wasn't quite sure what they were saying. Yeah, I'm not sure on that one either. Uh, yeah, I, like I left out some of the quote because it was... Yeah, I didn't understand this. I didn't either. I was like, did you have a little bit of Christmas drink before you wrote this? <laughs> but I don't know. Um, and so, like I said, it was just kind of interesting how they broke down the, the allies of World War One and... Right, yeah. yeah. So. And that they added recipes, too. Exactly, yeah. I wonder recipes. what the Italian... Well, you said you'll post them. I'll post them, yeah. And the, st the stuffing and... What was it? Italian fish recipe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to stay on the topic of food, but bring it back to America. And we're going to start with an article from 1996. And I have... I don't think I've ever read an article on this podcast this new. <laughs> I was going to say, wow, I, I had to look at that uh, Yeah, yeah. when I read the script before. Did you have to I look at it? I was like 19? 19 or 1896. Yeah, I don't think I've read an article newer than 1960-ish for this podcast, so this is kind of different. Um, but this article came from the Daily Advocate out of Stamford, Connecticut. And the author of the article, her name is Edith Preet. So she actually goes into how different countries celebrate and cook for Christmas. But I'm just going to go over the first part of her article where she relive, relives a Christmas memory from her childhood. And actually, I'm just going to read it because she wrote it beautifully. Oh. It's pretty cute. On December 24th, 1963, Philadelphia was hit with a rip-warring blizzard. I'll never forget it. By evening, the drifts were well past knee-high. Snowflakes swirled in the halos of, of streetlights. Driving anywhere was out of the question. Wrapped up in coats, boots, gloves, hats, and scarves, and loaded down with bags of presents, my girlfriend Bonnie, my mother, and I set out on foot for Aunt Tilda's house. What would have been a seven-minute drive turned into an hour trek. Oh, wow. I know. That's pretty bad. <laughs> um, and I remember laughing so hard we could hardly walk. At least they had a good attitude about it. <laughs> yeah. And so she goes on to say, We knew we were crazy to be slogging through such a storm, but we were determined to reach our destination. It was Christmas Eve, and Aunt Tilda had prepared the traditional Italian feast of seven fishes. Aunt Tilda's house was decorated to the rafters. Twinkling lights outlined every window. Tiny red and green Christmas balls hung from each curtain ruffle. Swags of tinsel garland dra draped the mirrors. The huge tree was covered with hundreds of ornaments she had been collecting for decades. At its top perched a gossamer angel, and beneath it, bedecked branches nestled the white and gold 30-piece nativity set that Aunt Tilda had stayed up in the wee hours painting on many a sweltering summer night. Wow. How cool is That's that? That's pretty... I. That would be nice to see. It would be really <laughs> nice. Um, it's a cool image. Like I said, she uh -huh. wrote this so beautifully. Um, and so... She says, Uncle Frank pressed glasses of sweet amber cherry into our hands, assuring us with a wink and a grin that it was the best way to warm our bones. <laughs> so he's sneaking them alcohol. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't for sure. Because, you know, it sounds like, you know, they're little girls and she brings her friend and they've been in the cold. And he's okay. like, this will warm you, you up. Um, <laughs> wow. I know, right? <laughs> Placing our gifts around the tree, we headed for the dining room. Uncles, aunts, cousins, grandma, and special friends crowded around the table. Presents would come later. It was time to feast. And what a feast it was. One by one, the seven fishes appeared. Smoked, o smoked oysters, stuffed calamari, sautéed in garlic and parsley, deep fried smelts, crisp flounder fillets, angel hair pasta tossed with breadcrumbs, and bits of anchovies. Just when we felt we couldn't eat another bite, Aunt Tilda carried in the bacala. The night special treat. It was a savory stew of salt cod and prunes that had simmered for hours in rich tomato gravy. By the time we left, the snow had stopped falling. We walked in silence, too full of good food to speak. Back home, Bonnie and I drank coffee and talked for hours. It had been her first Christmas experience. A week before, I had been a guest for Hanukkah dinner at her home. We decided that although the holidays we celebrated were different, sharing a celebration meal with family and friends was a universal, joyous occasion. That's good. That's really good that she got to go to the her first Christmas yeah, celebration that way. Exactly. And she went to the Hanukkah right. celebration with Bonnie. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, That's I good, just... Good learning experience at that young age. Exactly. See everybody's different traditions. Mm. And yeah, I just, I loved, I loved that story. Yeah, um, that was good. And like I said, after that, she goes in, I mean, she talks about Ukraine, um, British. She talks about all sorts of countries and like just their, just, you know, their traditions and kind of some of the primary food that they cook. But that first part, I was like, that mm-hmm. is so cute. That was good. <laughs> My favorite part is the... Um, Laughing so hard they could hardly walk in the snow. <laughs> right. And at that point, I was I didn't know they were just young. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because um, yeah, they're just little kids, and then yeah, because I mean, nineteen sixty three, and the article was wrote in ninety six. So and she's just oh, living that memory. That's cute. Yeah. yeah. I, and I like when Uncle Frank gives them the <laughs> the, the sherry. <laughs> Oh, so it's a little questionable, but <laughs> well, I mean, I think <laughs> I had a little bit of wine so when I, I was a kid, so <laughs> I, I wonder if we would have, we probably might not have even bad an eye if they had said wine. We might have been like, yeah, that's normal. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay. So the next one I'm actually just going to read too, because it's pretty humorous. And honestly, this article is, it's just like a series of small interviews and I kind of don't feel like summing it up in my own words, so I'm just going to read it because I'm tired. All right. <laughs> so, okay, so this article is, it, the title is, the headline is Feast of the Fishes. The date is December 24th, 1986, and it's from the Trenton Evening Times. Thomas Martello is the writer, and it's he starts off by saying, Christmas Eve must be the favorite day of the year for any cat within whiffing distance of Chambersburg. Because they cook the soaked fishes. Yeah. (laughs) That's because in kitchens all over Trenton's Italian neighborhood, as well as in households across the region, fish is stewing, frying, baking, boiling, broiling, and pickling. (laughs) (laughs) And we're not talking frozen Miss Paul's, friends. This fish will take hours of careful preparation with the aromas of garlic, olive oil, tomato sauce, and all kinds of tender fish meat filling the air. It will be served in a variety of sauces on platters and salads and over linguine with names like squid, octopus, and eel. Some of this fish ain't pretty. But the squeamish must merely close their eyes and allow the taste buds to see their dishes as a thane of beauty. In an Italian-American household, Christmas Eve means a bit more than presents under the tree and family gatherings. In an Italian-American household, Christmas Eve also means fish. Plates of fish spread out across the dining room table. Strange, wonderful fish your grandparents taught you how to pronounce. Fish you invite wide-eyed, non-Italian-American friends over to sample. Fish you eat but once a year. (laughs) This writing is so good. Um, To many, Christmas Eve is a feast, a feast of the fishes. It began to look a lot like Christmas about a week ago as loads of ugly-looking eel and squid began sharing the meat counter with the more docile-appearing chicken and turkeys. (laughs) The spirit continued over the weekend when Francis Benedetti cleaned bushels of clams and began to marinate codfish in preparation for a meal she has cooked for more than half a century at her Mott Street home. And this week, fish markets were flooded with customers. It is booming, said Rosario Spagnola, manager of Il Mercado Fish Market on Mott Street. We've had people from the counter to the door. The store has been jam-packed all week. It's a wonderful thing. You get the family together. You have dinner. You go to church at midnight. It's something special. So this is why I like this article, because it's just like these little tidbits from these Italians in Trenton, New Jersey. And so it's kind of cool. Of course, there's more to the Christmas Eve feast than fish. It's the getting together of the family I like most, said Dr. Frank Campo of the Italian of the American Italian Historical Society. You eat a little later, waiting for the late hours. You go to midnight mass. Midnight ma- mass is important because the feast of fish has religious origins, but through the years it has also gained an Italian flavor, and many who keep the tradition alive are a bit hazy about why it began. Do we do the feast of the fishes, said one Italian American political figure? Sure we do. All kinds. All over the place. Why do we do it? Well, we do it because we always did it. It's tradition. My grandparents did it. Let me ask my aunt and get back to you. (laughs) So, until 20 years ago, Christmas Eve was always a day of fast and abstinence, said Reverend Joseph Ferrante of St. Gregory and the great Roman Catholic Church in Hamilton. You weren't allowed to have meat. In Italy, a country surrounded by water, the one big meal of the day consisted of fish. Lots of fish. From what I have heard, it's seven fishes. Others say 13. 
Um, some people say 12 for the 12 days of Christmas. And like the question of numbers, there is the question of exactly what is served and how it is served. On this note, the Christmas Eve tradition not only varies from region to region in Italy, but from family to family. Recipes are carefully preserved and handed down, but your grandmother's most popular dish may not be her next door neighbor's. It takes such a great proportion, but there is no such thing as a typical Italian or typical Italian cuisine. The customs vary. Some of those kind of cool. That was good. Yeah. yeah. And what year was that written? Uh, 1986. Oh, okay. Yeah. I wondered because um, they said, um, this isn't Mrs. Paul's frozen, <laughs> frozen <laughs> fish. Yeah, that wouldn't be 1896. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's kind of like when you grew up, you guys had some sort of fish type things on Christmas Eve. But Yeah, we always had um, clam chowder and oyster stew and... And he, uh, dad always made um, homemade pizza. Oh, homemade pizza on Christmas Eve. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of neat because, you know, it, where, when it says, but there's no such thing as a typical Italian or typical Italian cuisine, the customs vary. Right. And, you know, like, well, you we used to have fish or some type of seafood on Christmas Eve. It's not the seven. And then, you know, there was seven of you. So. Right. That's <laughs> probably why they were. Um, Stew and chowder. Exactly. it goes a long way. It goes a long way. And then making pizza for the kids who maybe were squeamish. Couldn't. <laughs> couldn't eat it. eat it. And then Grandpa Papa married a woman from Boston. Right. So I'm yeah. <laughs> guessing the clam chowder might have been a little bit for her, too. That's true. <laughs> so. We did go to Mass. But we always did the early Mass. Did the early Mass, mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. So I just thought that was kind of neat because... Yeah, that was a nice article. Yeah. Yeah, but it goes on for quite a while. Um, and they kind of go on about bacala a lot. Like, how do you prepare it? How do you prepare it? And oh, so yeah. um, there's one part, though, that I want to read where Thomas Martello is interviewing um, Francis Benedetti. And she's talking about, you know, all of the stuff that she makes. And <laughs> then she starts talking about her grandkids. Um, because she added, she said, you know, that there's another dimension to this because the next generation that sometimes marry non-Italians. And so she says, when the kids see the octopus, the great big eels and the claws, they say, grandma, how can you eat that? She said, calamari tentacles, for example, are particularly gruesome looking and have been known to frighten many a little sister, but they're also delicious. (laughs) And then she says, my Hungarian grandchildren, they'll eat everything. But the Irish grandchildren, they keep asking how we can eat this. <laughs> Benedetti said, I tell them they never had it so good. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was kind of cute. I have to agree with the Irish a little bit. Yeah. I'm not big on some a whole lot of fish. But... I'm not at all. So for me, this would be a rough Christmas Eve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so that was kind of a, a cool article. Um, yeah, that was good. And I want to close by reading... An article from 1996 again, December of 1996, and it is from a paper called The Record out of New Jersey, and somehow I ran across this article, and I am just going to read this because this is great. Um, The article is called Gifts for Provolone Lovers. (laughs) Bill Ervolino wrote it. It's humorous. It's it's interesting. So we're going to close with this because it's funny. Um, Okay, so here's the article. A couple of years ago, a Jewish friend told me he was going to the home of an Italian-American acquaintance for Christmas, and he wanted to bring some gifts for the children. He asked if there were any special things Italian children liked for Christmas. Naturally, I said, Italian kids want the same things that all the other kids want for Christmas. Just get them something big, bright, and unbreakable. (laughs) Good answer, right? Well, a couple of days ago, I opened up the December issue of Italy and Me magazine. And then he puts, don't go looking for it. I'm making this all up. (laughs) And what to my wandering eyes should appear, but the following list of the top 10 Italian oriented toys, games, and specialty items for Christmas 1996. (laughs) Okay. So number one is Tickle Me Emilio (laughs) instead of, um... What's Elmo. That? Elmo, thank you. I'm like, what's that little guy's name? So Tickle Me Emilio. Uh, the adorably furry Tickle Me Emilio doll. That is hard to say. <laughs> um, based on the popular character featured in the column is the number one Christmas gift this year. And no wonder. Tickle him. Are you ready? He laughs. What could be more thrilling, imaginative, and educational? Each doll, <laughs> Each doll comes with thick bifocals, 
dual hearing aids, and a pot belly that jiggles when you tickle. <laughs> Other oh, models wow. include Don't Tickle Me, Emilio. He refuses to laugh. Fickle Me, Tickle Me, Emilio. <laughs> sometimes he laughs and sometimes he doesn't. And the brand new Tickle Me, Emilio with prostate problems. Just add water. <laughs> And he made, he's just making all this up. He is just making all of this up. So he's just, you know, he pretended that he opened this fake magazine and okay. here's the top gifts, but <clears throat> pretty creative. Some of this is hard to say though, because it's like tongue twisters. Number two is the Antipasto Morphin Power Rangers. <laughs> Christmas dinner won't be the same once these colorful action figures burst from their box and start running around the table. <laughs> Watch the look of amazement on your child's face as the Power Rangers kick antipasto into his salad plate, kung fu the salami, and somersault through the roasted peppers. <laughs> Who says oh, eating dinner has to be boring? And wait until you see the, oops, there goes another mozzarella ball. <laughs> Fun for the whole family. <laughs> oh, this guy is creative. Um, all right, number three is tomato patch kids. <laughs> Uh, raised with plenty of amore in a secluded garden in western Sicily, the tomato patch kids are so cute you'll want to eat them up. The dolls have their own birth certificates and biographical information and arrive wrapped in blankets of basil. Each kid comes with a set of three diapers, garlic powder, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> instead of baby powder, right. and extra virgin baby oil. Mmm, you'll wish all the kids smelled this good. <laughs> Okay. He didn't throw in some garlic there. He did say garlic powder. Oh, that's instead true. Instead of baby yeah, powder. <laughs> yeah, he's got the garlic, onion, basil. He's got it all. Um, okay, so number four is Barbie's big fat Italian Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> and I I haven't read all of these. I just skimmed it. So um, let your favorite doll ride in style this holiday season with Barbie's big fat Italian Cadillac. Choice of ebony, ivory, red, or pink. <laughs> Comes with Corinthian leather upholstery, plastic slip covers, optional. <laughs> Plush imported carpeting, a giant red pepper hanging from the rear of your mirror, <laughs> and Kiss Me, I'm Italian bumper sticker. Other bumper stickers include Follow Me Like Mom and My Middle Name is Bingo. I don't know yet. I don't know either one of those. Follow me like mom. But <laughs> I don't know either one of those. I like the kiss me in Italian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, if you know what those are, give us a shout out because yeah. I'm not sure. All right. So number five, we're going to stay with Barbie. Uh, number five is Barbie's big fat Italian wedding. I wonder if this was the year that the, oh, Greek, Greek, wedding. <laughs> the Greek movie came out. And what year is this? 96. Oh, no, the first one came out in 2002. Yeah, because it was called My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Oh, so the saying must have been really My Big Fat Italian Wedding. My Big Fat Italian. And the Greek movie one took the Italian and put yep, it in Greek. exactly. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah I just this assumed, is 96. Yeah, because I have never really heard My Big Fat Italian Wedding. I haven't either. So yeah. I just assumed that the Greek, but that makes that sense. That makes sense, yeah. All right, so... Uh, Barbie's Big Fat Italian Wedding. Children will want to invite all their other dolls, especially the ones who aren't talking to each other. <laughs> the, uh, to Barbie's Big Fat Italian Wedding. The set includes seating for 200 guests, loud obnoxious DJ, a 75-inch Viennese table with sparklers, 100 crystal ashtray souvenirs, <laughs> Barbie and Ken, version April 12, 1997, Tiny gift envelopes, <laughs> silk purse to store tiny gift envelopes, and choice of three entrees. Faux fish, rubber chicken, or plastic prime ribs. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> okay, so number six is Winnie the Pooh Struffoli Oven. And it says, your kids can make their own Italian honey balls this year with this fully funct functional, battery-operated Winnie the Pooh oven from Mattel. <laughs> So instead of Easy Bake Oven. All right, that's cute. <laughs> that is cute. Set includes oven, 25 watt bulb, struffoli dough, and what else? Lots and lots of honey. And don't forget to check out Mattel's new and improved piglet sausage grinder. Oh, good grief. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so number seven is Fisher Price Play Vila. Children love playing in the Fisher Price Play Vila, an easy to assemble 35 room playhouse. Jeez, Louise. Okay, <laughs> How big is this thing? Uh, 
<laughs> Made of durable kid-proof plastic. Perfect for indoor and outdoor fun. The Play Vila comes with a 25-year mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> Authentic Mediterranean style living room, furniture for company only, and a 600 pound crystal chandelier with dimmer. <laughs> 600 pounds. <laughs> this guy's funny. He is funny. Uh, number eight is In La Opoly. So, uh-uh. instead of Monopoly, In La Opoly. <laughs> In this variation of the popular Monopoly board game, all the grandparents have died. <laughs> Jeez Louise. <laughs> like I said, I have not read this, so this is all new to me, too. And players... <laughs> this is terrible. And players fight over the houses, stocks, and other holdings while learning the ins and outs of brutal confrontations, <laughs> bitter accusations, and nasty things they can call their cousins. <laughs> This is too true. <laughs> um, you boards don't need to go to school for that one. <laughs> no, I don't need to go to school for that one. Uh, board sites include "Go Directly to Hell," oh, "Who Stole Nona's Jewelry," <laughs> and "Pass Go and See What Happens to Your Tires." <laughs> oh man! All right. Well, that one was interesting. <laughs> This guy is good. He's good. Yep. Yeah. Number nine: Play school talking Italian camera. Uh-oh. Oh, this should be interesting. <laughs> we both go. We're like, oh, geez. <laughs> this fully working camera uses 200 speed film up to 24 exposures, takes real photos, and mumbles all sorts of cute things while it's doing its thing, including shut your face. <laughs> Let's get this over with. Luca Brasi sleeps with the fishes. And of course, the very funny say provolone. <laughs> so say cheese. A guaranteed crowd pleaser. <laughs> And our number 10 toy is Barney Croon's Italian Favorites. <laughs> so, the purple dinosaur Barney back in the day. Oh. Yeah, okay. so that, that was, you know, the cartoon back then. The lovable TV dinosaur turns lounge lizard on this CD collection of 12 beloved Italian songs served up with a Barney-esque twist. Selections include I Love You, You Love Me, and Everybody Loves Somebody, Sometimes. <laughs> 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 uh, Mala Femina, Bad Brontosaurus, and When the Moon Hits Your Eye Like a Petrodactical Flying By. <laughs> and that's the Stone Age, Udino. <laughs> uh, oh, and that, that is our Christmas episode. <laughs> that was fun. That was fun. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I kind of like just doing these little articles and... Yeah, that was so, good research. Thanks. Yeah, it came out pretty good. But uh, I hope all you provolone lovers have a good <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> yeah, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, yep. everybody. Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Um, and we hope you come back to listen to more stories about Italian-Americans. See you next time. See you next time.